Hi, this is Steve Rubin, author of the James Bond movie Encyclopedia and the Twilight Zone Encyclopedia. I'm here today being interviewed for Spoiler Country. Hello, listeners of Spoiler Country. Today on the show, we have the fantastic guest, Mr. Steve Rubin. How's it going, Steve? Good to meet you, Jeff. Um, really happy to be here today. Very pleasure to meet you. I actually almost said sir again and was able to stop myself the very last second. It's okay. <laughs> say, uh, if you, Steve or sir or hey, you works. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, well, we'll go with the, more, the very formal Master Rubin. <laughs> <laughs> so... As the writer of both the James Bond and Twilight Zone encyclopedias, do you remember your earliest memories of the franchises and what got you um, in inspired by them? Sure, sure. I'll start with the Twilight Zone. I was eight years old. At that time, I was watching mostly cartoons and maybe some Westerns. And one night I kind of wandered into the living room my parents had on the Twilight Zone. And it was an episode called The Silence where this club guy you know, they're a member of one of these posh clubs, private clubs. He, he doesn't like this motor mouth who just constantly talks, 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 talks. So he bets the guy a half a million dollars that he can't shut up for a year. So they, <laughs> they put him in this glass cage in the basement and they monitor his every movement. And that so freaked me out as a kid, the thought of you know, the thought of just uh, not being able to speak for a year that I just, I said, no way am I watching this. <laughs> so I, I didn't come back to the Twilight Zone until it went into reruns probably about 10 years later. So that was my first brush with, with the Twilight Zone. With James Bond, my dad would go on business trips and he would bring back generally Westerns, paperbacks. And I had no interest in reading about Westerns. I was watching plenty of them on TV. But one day I was 12 years old and he dropped uh, a paperback called Goldfinger on my desk. Now, this was one of the signet colorful paperbacks with a nude woman on the cover. She was tastefully covering her privates because she was all dressed in gold or draped in gold or however, painted in gold. But I, I, I said, what is that? <laughs> and I started to read Goldfinger. And, you know, for an impressionable only child, rel rel relatively conservatively raised, uh, reading Goldfinger was kind of like a watershed moment. And that being 1964, that Christmas, lo and behold, Goldfinger, the movie is released. And probably that movie had more of an impact on me than most movies I'd ever seen in my life. And kind of cool that I had already read the book. And it was such a such an experience seeing that movie. We didn't, we, living in Southern California, we didn't generally go to the Chinese theater in Hollywood. We, it was kind of a little bit out of our turf. But for this movie, we decided to go up to Hollywood Boulevard and see it on the big screen. So you can imagine Goldfinger on the big screen at the fabled Chinese theater. Boy, what an experience. It, it, it really is amazing just how much of an impact something like film and television can have, have especially when we're impressionable and young. It, you know, it, it's easy to say that kind of any kind of TV show or not is just entertainment, but it does kind of impact you. It stays with you forever, doesn't it? It does. Uh, you know, I often I often think about Shakespearean scholars who kind of analyze the plays of Shakespeare for decades, oh, covering every word, every phrase. And movies are kind of like our Shakespeare. I mean, for me, they are. They're definitely some things I study over and over again. I've always been fascinated by the way movies are made. I studied uh, history in college. I was a reporter for the UCLA Daily Bruin. I kind of got into doing research. So when I got out of college, I started writing my first book, which was on, it was called Combat Films, American Realism, 1945 to 1970. And I started interviewing the filmmakers who made some of the great war films of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, up to 1970 when Patton was released. And I just, the more I learned about how movies were made, the more I was fascinated by the business. And at that same time, 
I started writing for a Chicago film journal called Cine Fantastique, which was one of the first film magazines to cover the behind the scenes world of science fiction, fantasy and horror films. And I got a lot of recognition for my work. My first cover story was on, uh, let's see, that was on The Day the Earth Stood Still. I spent six, six months piecing together the history of the original 1951 classic. Oh, oh that is amazing. I, I, I did um, notice that you went to the University of uh, UCLA. Correct. At, for a history and journalism major. Now, why did you choose those majors? What was about them that you thought had that, that just kind of captured your attention saying, I want to be that? Well, I was always a history student. I think it's funny because movies about history fed my interest in history and vice versa. So it was natural for me to be a history major. UCLA did not have a formal formal journalism department. It had been disbanded by that time. But I started writing for the Daily Bruin and being a feature reporter, you know, kind of doing news, I was kind of a beat reporter. I just uh, enjoyed that whole process. I, I guess it's a little bit of vanity. Once you see your name in print by Steve Rubin, it kind of captured me and led me down the path to becoming a writer. So it, it really is kind of magical when you have your name in print. I mean, it, 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 it does. Is it because and maybe it helps that you also had interest in history? That you do feel like at that moment you are you you are immortal. At the moment something you're in print, the moment it can be pointed to beyond your life and say this is something you contributed, you are forever immortalized. Is, was that part of the passion, or was it something else about seeing your name in print and having that feeling? It was just fun. It was just fun to be walking past a student reading the newspaper and reading my article and realizing they were reading something that I wrote. It was just kind of a cool feeling. I was much too immature to be thinking about immortality at that point. I was more interested in just uh, writing stories that people would find fun and interesting. And I had, I had a lot of fun at the Bruin. I wrote about probably about 70 stories over my two years there. And it just got me interested in the whole concept of, again, doing research and you know, writing extended pieces. And when I got out of UCLA, I for I toyed with the idea of going into television news, kind of that arena, but I found it a little too exploitive. I, I couldn't picture myself shoving microphones in people's faces who didn't want to talk. So I gravitated towards writing that combat films book and continuing writing for some film magazines. But I learned early on that I couldn't make any money doing any of this. I mean, this is all really nice stuff to be a writer and call yourself a writer and write magazine articles and, you know, write book, film books. But they didn't really produce much money. So what happened was I came back from a Europe trip in 1977 after I had done the research for my first James Bond book. And I got a job working in a public relations agency. I was told that because of my work in magazine writing and just my comfort in the industry that I might be useful as a staff writer at a PR agency. Now, you, you tell me PR agency in 1970. Seven. I had no idea what a PR agency was. I, I really had no clue. But I came back and I got the job and uh, I got hired by United Artists at that time. They were doing the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the Donald Sutherland, Leonard Nimoy remake. And they needed somebody to go to science fiction conventions to basically set up a table and promote the movie all around the country. And I had been going to conventions for a few years because those magazine articles I'd been writing for Cine Fantastique, they didn't pay me any money. They gave me magazines to sell at conventions and uh, I got to keep the money I made from the magazine. So uh, I knew the circuit. George, Phil Kaufman, who directed the movie, he was very friendly with George Lucas. And what had happened is before Star Wars came out in the summer of 77, they sent a gentleman named Charlie Lippincott around the country for a year to promote Star Wars at science fiction conventions. So Phil wanted to do the same thing for Body Snatchers, and I became his guy. So as a publicist in the, in the 70s, what were your expectations? Because nowadays, I'm, I'm, I imagine with media being basically at everyone's fingertips, back in the 70s, it was a different world. How, how, what, what, what were you tasked to do in, in that field to make sure that you, what you were being paid to do 
was reaching people's attention? Well, first I started at what they call an advance man or advance publicist. This body snatcher's gig basically sent me out with the with the materials to promote the movie. Essentially a big display case, big photographic enlargements of the movie, some audio from Leonard Nimoy, and then a slide presentation, which I would give to a group. After I finished that assignment, I actually went into a formal agency and became a staff writer at a PR agency. That was after the Body Snatchers tour. And then I realized there was a position in Hollywood that seemed very interesting to me, which was called unit publicist. A unit publicist is the publicist who's actually attached to the crew of a film that is shooting. And in 1981, I was hired to go to Wyoming for two months to work on an Alan Rudolph thriller called Endangered Species with Joe Beth Williams and Robert Urich. And basically as an assigned publicist on a film set, my job is to, I'm the first PR person associated with the film. So I write what they call the press kit, which includes all the biographies of the various people involved in the synopsis of the film and any interesting behind the scenes stories. And then I try to encourage some journalists to come to set, not a ton, but a few, because we're shooting in rural Wyoming. It's not like they can just hop over to the film set. So I did that. And I did that kind of off and on, probably from 1981 to 1993. So for about 12 years, and I worked on a lot of interesting films. I worked on John Hughes' Pretty in Pink. I worked on the sequel to uh, Weekend at Bernie's. I worked on the sequel to Porky's. I worked on the sequel to Eddie and the Cruisers and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And then I went to work for Showtime in 92 and 93. And then I became more of a staff director of the production publicity side. So I was hiring the unit publicist. And that's where I made my producing debut in 2001. I was able to convince the head of programming at Showtime to do a baseball comedy called Bleacher Bums about the fans who follow the Chicago Cubs from Chicago to Wrigley Field. And uh, that was my producing debut. We, pr we filmed that in uh, Toronto, Canada, about six months before 9-11. So I did that. And then after I did that, I also was able to sell a movie to the Hallmark Channel called Silent Night, which was a World War II uh, true story of a truce in the Ardennes in, on Christmas Eve 1944, when American and German combat troops were able to meet, and break bread, and left as friends in the morning. Quite an interesting story. Well uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit to try to get some clarification on something that you that you said, okay? Go ahead. You mentioned that while you were doing uh, publicity for conventions, you had audio of Leonard Nimoy. Was that something that you, you actually met Leonard Nimoy and spoke to him at these conventions, or was there a connection? I, Sorry. I, I, w I would have loved to have met Leonard Nimoy, but they gave that to me as one of my tools for my promotional kit. Interestingly, the year after I did the Body Snatchers tour, I was hired by Leonard Nimoy. I was hired to be the advance man for his one-man uh, theater show called Vincent. It was a story of Vincent Van Gogh's brother's relationship with Vincent Van Gogh. And I, we went to Omaha and uh, Nebraska and or Aurora, Illinois, and I was the advance man on that theater production. So I got to kind of hang with Leonard, which was a great thrill. Holy crap. That, you know, there's millions of people in the world right now who are utterly jealous and probably a little bit hate you for having had an opportunity <laughs> out with Leonard Nimoy. Just, just, just uh, friendly hate, but just a little bit of uh, jealous hatred. Well, he was, <laughs> he, he was a fun guy. It's so funny because being a, a, a Trekkie and being uh, interested in the whole film world, we would sit at dinner with the whole crew because he had a whole uh, crew with him, you know, the, his, his play producer and the people who were associated with the play. And I, the minute I would start asking him about Star Trek and movies, Leonard would look at me and say, Steve, we're working on a theater project. We only discuss theater. <laughs> you, he must be so used to doing that to people. Like, stop. I'm not interested. Like, it, it, you, do you think people who have those deep backgrounds do get sick of talking about that over time? I mean, I, I imagine at some point and anyone would get tired of saying, talking, saying the same things over and over again. There's only so many things you can say. <laughs> 
uh, he was a blast, and and I had a lot of fun on that project. I always have fun with the actors. You know, ninety nine percent of them are just terrific people that are fun to be with. And uh, there's a occasionally, occasionally a few stick in the muds who drive you a little bit crazy, but it's part of the turf. And I enjoyed my pr uh, whole uh, career doing publicity. I did it for. God, I, I guess I did it for about 25 years, and then uh, I graduated to full-time producing and writing in the early 2000s. What, what do you prefer? Do you prefer producing? Did you enjoy being a unit publicist the most? Do you prefer writing the most? Well, I really enjoyed taking a project like I did with Silent Night and, and, and Bleacher Bums, basically creating it from scratch, you know, bringing it to the marketplace, making the movie. I love being on a film set. That's my favorite place to be. And being a producer is just the ultimate, you know, thrill for me. I'm, but I'm also very active as a writer now, not only my books, but I'm writing screenplays almost full time. I mean, basically I have two different partners. One I write animation with, the other one I write comedy with, and then I'm also writing some stuff entirely on my own. But I'm very active in writing. You know, I'm kind of, it's a little late in life for me. I'm not exactly 22 anymore by far, but I have a lot of ambition to get some of our stories out there, particularly what I call fun movies. Movies that you we, we call popcorn movies in the day where you just go to the movies, have fun and feel good afterwards. So speaking of writing partners, who is Billy Ryback? Billy Reback. Billy Reback. Oh, sorry about the <laughs> saying the name wrong. Reback. No, that's completely fine. Billy Reback arguably is one of the funniest men in America. He he was a former stand-up comic. He was the, one of the early writer producers on the Home Improvement TV series, the Tim Allen series. He wrote for a lot of the Disney Channel shows. He, he and I have known each other for 35 years. Uh, we've written scripts together on numerous occasions. We're very much tied to bringing back fun comedy to the masses now. We've written 17 spec scripts in the last five years, and we're out there every day trying to sell them. When, when you think about comedy, there seems to be some controversy now and again about whether or not comedy is still comedy. And by that, I mean... Do you find that what is was funny and what worked maybe 5, 10, 20 years ago is still universally accepted as funny? I mean, does funny is that something that is universal or do you find that changes with the time? Oh, it's definitely changed with the time. I think our co comedy has become way, way harder edged. I think there's a lot of graphic language now. The raunchy comedy seems to be the one that the studios like to do, kind of inspired by the success of Hangover. I, I just don't write that kind of comedy. We're, we're more, our inspired projects, you know, our, and the projects we, are, we do are inspired by films like Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, uh, Night at the Museum, even, even The Wizard of Oz. We just, we just love fun comedies that make you feel good. And is it because, like I said, those comedies not only do make you feel good, but you know they, they are. You found it more of an escape than harder edge comedy. Do you think it when you add that extra edginess? Do you think you lose that kind of maybe almost mental relaxation that you would get from just enjoying a good comedy movie or TV? Well, I think the big thing is that you lose a wider audience. I think when you stand on the street corner with your 85 year old grandmother and your eight year old and your wife and you're deciding what to see, there aren't a lot of choices for a family audience to see anymore. I mean, you know, are kids allowed to grow up anymore? I mean, you smack them right off the bat with raunchy comedy. It doesn't give them much time. I think that our goal is to make movies that you just have fun with and you don't offend anybody with. I mean, it's just, we've kind of lost something in this country. I think we've lost maybe a loss of innocence or whatever you call it, but I think you can still do a fun comedy. The movies that I laughed at 50 years ago, I still laugh at. You put on a Marx Brothers comedy or Abbott and Costello or Mel Brooks or Monty Python, those movies are still funny today, uh, 40 or 50 years later. I don't find a lot of the comedies that get released today that funny thing, you know, frankly. And I think the other thing that's kind of interesting is that I think more than ever before, we're an extremely stratified society. And I think the issue with that, and at least in my opinion, the issue with that is that you do lose that shared experience. Like, like you mentioned, being able to watch a movie with your grandmother or, you know, your parent if you're a child. I don't think that as, happens as often anymore because everyone, because there's so many streaming services, so many 
TV shows that reach just a very niche interest that I don't think we do share common experience, especially with cinema. And I think that is something that is lost, don't you? Absolutely. I, you know, they, they talk about the death of the movie theater, which I believe will not die. I think movie theaters are going to come back strongly. But when you have a fun comedy and you're sitting in a room with 500 people and everybody's laughing, that is uh, that is a, a terrific experience. It's a visceral experience. You feel the pulse of the movie through all the laughter. I, I can't tell you how many times in the past I've sat in a movie theater laughing my head off and just enjoying, uh, just enjoying the fun of being in a large group and we're all having fun. Now, conversely, I've also been in, I went to see The Exorcist the first month it was open and the terror in that audience was palpable as well. In fact, there was a scene where it was so scary, people started laughing afterwards only because they were too scared to, you know, they had to do something. <laughs> well, and I think another thing you said is very interesting when you come out to like the universality of a great film that, you say like the Marx Brothers, listening to it back when it first came out to now, funny is funny. And I think it's very interesting that there are certain films that hold up forever and I think that are going to be in their own, let's use another word that I used earlier, the immortal. You directed a documentary called Return to the Great Escape. I did. Which I did. was a phenomenal movie. I, re I remember The Great Escape, was, I mean, it was well before my time, but well before I was alive. But my father who loved the movie, sat me down, and, and I watched the movie with him. And I was amazed, just once again, just how good it is. I will say that the ending, so I don't ruin it for anybody, was ex such a downer that it may be hard to watch it the second time. But I did find it to be an amazingly well-done movie. So what, was, so what was about that movie that made you want to do a documentary about it? Well, interesting. Like I said earlier, when I read Goldfinger, it was exciting to see the movie Goldfinger that year. The previous year, I had read the book The Great Escape by Paul Brickhill. So when The Great Escape movie came out, it was a thrill as well. The Great Escape is what I call my desert island movie. Everybody has one movie that if they could only take one movie to a desert island, that would be it. Well, The Great Escape is my desert island movie. I have I've loved that movie ever since I've seen it. I've probably seen it two or 300 times. I had an extensive, in my combat films book, I had an extensive sit down interview with John Sturgis who directed it. I once gave Steve McQueen directions in Culver City, California, which was one of my favorite celebrity encounters. I did the commentary track when they released the movie in a special uh, DVD in 2004, and I was nominated that year for best classic commentary. I've done another documentary just recently called The Coolest Guy Movie Ever, which is currently available on Amazon. Again, covering The Great Escape, I hooked up with a French filmmaker who was taking a camera crew to all the sites where the film was made and comparing them to how they look today. And just a lot of my, a lot of fun. Chris Espinon was the filmmaker. I ended up producing the film with him. It was released by Virgil Films and Entertainment. I, ever, I just love The Great Escape. I mean, it's one of those movies that it, you, they really capture lightning in a bottle with that story and that cast. Now, kind of going back a little bit to what we talked earlier and kind of connecting to what we talked about now, having gone to UCLA, which is a very prestigious high college, and studying journalism and history, which is so important to the training of compiling information, focus, details. Did that help you when putting together a documentary for something like The Great Escape, where you kind of, you had that training to kind of hone, hone, hone in on information, know where to look, how to organize that? Was that, was that kind of, was that training back then what helped you later now? Well, my training as a journalist, where I had to interview people, transcribe the tapes, pull out the appropriate quotes, was all good uh, background for me. And then on my history papers, you know, reading, reading great books on the history of a certain subject and then culling that material to put your papers together was very useful as background, all carefully footnoted so that you weren't stealing work, you were honoring work. Sure, sure. All of that comes in handy when you're putting a film together, whether it's a documentary or a narrative film, you just, you, all that comes in very handy. So what did you, in doing the research for The Great Escape, what did you find that kind of shocked you about it? And was there anything that in doing that research and making your document, I'm sure docu the documentary, you can't make a 10 hour long documentary or 20 hour long documentary because you know, you have to keep it within a certain confine. Was there anything that you wish you could, 
that could have been put in uh, that could have been fit into it that you just had to cut out for let's say time issues. So I guess both questions. Well, the the return to the Great Escape documentary was released by Showtime in '93 on the 30th anniversary of the film. It only, I think, it only runs 24 minutes. I mean, frankly, given the opportunity, I could have done a full hour on the Great Escape. We could have gotten into some of the history a little bit more. In terms of shocking, I mean, I learned in my research that Steve McQueen was actually fired from that movie because he was on he was unhappy with his character. And he actually uh, walked off the set one day and refused to come back until his character was rewritten. So he didn't <laughs> shoot for six weeks. So that was shocking to me. Fortunately, they were able to uh, work things out because he was he was actually fired at one point. James Garner, who was playing Henley, the uh, air, the, the, uh, the scrounger in the story, he was going to take over some of Steve McQueen's duties on it. But yeah, yeah, it was, uh, there was a lot of material there. there. There's a lot of interesting information on the making of that movie, most of which I put in my book, Combat Films. God, that would have been a totally different movie if Steve McQueen <laughs> was kept out of that movie. Right. I, actually, I really enjoyed the bit in Quentin Tarantino's recent film, the What's Upon a Time in Hollywood, because I thought it was funny that Leo DiCaprio did that whole thing where he talks about how he was almost up for the role. And they actually put him in the scene where Steve McQueen's in The Great Escape. It was great. Well, that is awesome. So total... How much time was spent researching for this documentary? Not a lot because I had a, I had done all the research primarily for my book, the combat films book. So it was just most of my work was in tracking down the people I had already interviewed for the book and getting them on camera. And then my partner on the Return to the Great Escape, Deborah Goodwin, she went over to France to interview Donald Pleasance. And then we met in Munich, and then we took the camera crew around Germany to film on some of those locations for the 93 documentary. So th th that documentary actually got nominated for a DVD exclusive award. Is that correct? For best audio uh, commentary? The, the, not the documentary, but my audio commentary for that disc. They actually, when they, that, that documentary, I think, was, was used at one point on the DVD release. But in 2004, they came out with a special DVD, and I was able to do the commentary track, and that was nominated for Best Classic Commentary. I ended up losing to Peter Jackson for Lord of the Rings. Well, goddamn Peter Jackson. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, honestly, I guess if you're going to lose to somebody, it might as well be someone like Peter Jackson. Exactly. <laughs> so what did that nomination mean to you? Like, is there validation in the nomination, or was that kind of just like a pleasant thing? Or did you feel that that kind of made everything you did kind of just not, not just maybe just not the right word but did validate all that work that put into oh, it. oh it was just uh, jeff it was just fun it was just fun i mean i got a call january 1st that year and a friend of mine calls me up and said what do you have in common with peter jackson julie andrews matt groaning and, and i can't forget the other nominee i said what are you talking about he says you've been nominated for best class of commentary and it was it was a thrill for me i mean anytime anybody recognizes your work especially on a movie that i consider my desert island movie so it was fun and once again talking about being immortalized you are now forever going to be connected to the great escape which i guess is if you're going to be connected to one movie that's definitely one of them to be remembered with. I am totally fine with that. <laughs> so later on, you would write two encyclopedias. You wrote the Twilight Zone um, encyclopedia and the James Bond encyclopedia. Those are two franchises that in some form have been around for decades. How daunting is it to compile data and information for franchises that have been around on and off for now, I guess it's almost 70 years in, in at least one uh, case of Twilight Zone. Well, the, 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 let's talk about the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone came on the air in 1959, ran for five years, 156 episodes. Rod Serling wrote 92 of them. A, a terrific series, one of the greatest series of all time, probably the best cast television series of all time. A book was written in 1982 by Mark Scott Zacree called The Twilight Zone Companion, which was a very well-received book. It was I, I enjoyed it very much. It, it's the first time I saw all 156 episodes in a book. But I felt that that the, the series could also benefit from the approach of an encyclopedia because I really wanted to fill in the gaps about the people who were involved in the series, particularly the actors. 
there were hundreds of actors involved in the Twilight Zone, many of whom we've forgotten today. And they were character actors. And I wanted to devote some time to them, put their picture in the uh, book, get some biographical information out there so that if you're watching an episode of the Twilight Zone and it mentions an actor like Jack Klugman, you can go to my listing and find out a little bit more about Jack Klugman or Burgess Meredith or James Whitmore or William Reynolds, or, you know, not only the Robert Redfords and Burt Reynolds, who obviously we know who they are, but some of the minor character actors who got their shot to be leads on The Twilight Zone was really kind of an ambition of mine. So The Twilight Zone Encyclopedia came together because I really wanted to do service to the people who made this series successful. You know, the producer, Buck Houghton, obviously Rod Serling himself, everybody I could, the directors, the writers, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, people like that, George Clayton Johnson. These are the classic writers that worked with Serling. There was a lot of information. And also I find the encyclopedia idea kind of a fun book, more of a tribute book that you can just pop in and out of. You don't have to read it cover to cover. I'd had success with the first edition of my James Bond encyclopedia, which we'll talk about in a minute because I have now have now released the fourth edition. So I've discovered that people like the encyclopedia format because they can browse around and have fun. Now, going back to the Twilight Zone, the Twilight Zone has, was it, three inter iterations or four iterations? Does your encyclopedia carry each iteration, including the Jordan Peele version of the Twilight Zone, or are you maintaining with the original? I am a total black and white snob. The book is only that first five seasons of black and white episodes. I will say today, I've said it before, you put the Twilight Zone in color, you lose half of your atmosphere. So I'm dealing with the classic original Twilight Zone. So was there any point in compiling, once again, these, this massive encyclopedia that you thought, God damn, this is such a daunting task. Like, did, did you was someone else think to yourself, how crazy am I to even be attempting this? Or did you always, was it something that you just loved anyway and you knew you were just going to plow forward? Or did you at any point think, yeah, I may have dug too deep <laughs> for trying to do all this? It was a daunting task. I mean, there's a lot of work to do, but I really loved the fact that I could dive into this type of thing. As a film producer, you can sit there literally for a decade and have no movie to show for all your efforts, whether you're writing or developing material, acquiring rights. For a number of reasons, you're not selling. And I kind of felt like I'd been on the sidelines too long. I got to get back writing and getting something into the marketplace. So the Twilight Zone served a big purpose for me that it got me back into the marketplace of pop culture where I could share my love of something. You know, I still have all my movies I'm developing, but, you know, it takes it literally can take years, decades, whatever. I mean, for for a time there. Well, time there. For 20 years, I tried to get a movie made on the TV series Combat. That was another show that I really loved back in the 1960s. And I acquired the film rights from ABC to make the series. I actually sold it to, to Paramount, but they decided to make Saving Private Ryan instead. So Combat never got made. So there was 20 years where I had no movie to show for it, even though I made a little money. That was the good part. But you know, these books serve a big purpose for me. They keep me kind of flowing out into the marketplace to share my love of film. And is there, I mean, did you did you find anything in researching for your Twilight Zone encyclopedia that really kind of shocked you? Well, there are a lot of stories about the zone that are interesting. I'll tell you actually a funny story. I don't know if this is so much a shock, but it's an odd story, a very Twilight Zone story. Uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about how Rod wrote. You know, what was his methodology? What were his inspirations, motivations? So I become very friendly with Carol Serling, his widow. And I would go up to her, her house and she would let me look at the original contract. She gave me a ton of photographs. She was enormously helpful in compiling my book with me. But she said, you should read this book, especially the opening preface. And she handed me a bound book. It was uh, published back in, the, back in the day of Rod's live television plays before he got into the zone, you know, plays like patterns and requ requiem for a heavyweight the comedian 
And there was a very long preface where he talked about his inspirations and motivations. So I brought the book home. I put it on my desk. And then I was called to some kind of activity. I think my wife and I had to go to a dinner that night. I, I was eager to read that preface. So I came back and the book disappeared. Oh, shit. It was sitting on now. It was sitting on my desk. Now, nobody broke into our house. There was absolutely no reason for it not to be there. I looked for that book for three days. I practically tore my office apart because, first of all, she's giving me Rod's personal copy of his of his bound TV scripts. Now, I right. was able to purchase another copy of it on on uh, eBay, you know, for a hundred dollars. So at least I got her the book back, a book back. Thankfully, it wasn't autographed. But to this day, I don't know where that book went. Jesus. I think it, I think it went into the Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost of Rod Sterling was like, I'm taking this damn book back. <laughs> You'll get to have my book. <laughs> and here, here's, a, here's another one for you, Jeff. I went sure. to Binghamton, New York, where they, where they were doing a symposium on the zone. They do it every few years there. And uh, a, a wonderful writer took me to Rod's home where he grew up. And we stood in front of the house and a lady came out of the house and offered to take a picture of me with my friend. And here's the funny thing is, she I hand her my iPhone, she takes the picture, I look at the picture, it's in black and white. <laughs> How is that possible? I handed her the phone. They're, they're, you have to set it for black and white for it to be black and white. So there's another do 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 do. Once again, it's it's it's, it's Rod Serling looking down, go, you know, you know, if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it right. <laughs> <laughs> so, in in doing that research, did you get a deeper understanding of why the Toy Zone has survived as well as it has for all these decades? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The just just learning about the reaction to these morality plays. You know, Rod was very, very upset with network television at that time. This was the live television era. They were doing a lot of his dramas on TV, but they didn't want to do anything controversial. He really wanted to tell the story of the, the Emmett Till murder, where a young black man whistled at a white woman, I think it was in Mississippi, and he was hung for doing that. And he, a, a network executive actually told Rod Serling, we can do the story but you've got to turn him into a Mexican. And Rod was outraged and just so upset with something like that, that he just said, I'm getting out of here. So he, uh, fortunately it was the end of the live TV era. Everything was moving to California for film. So the Twilight Zone was a perfect, perfectly timed story that he, our series that he could tell his morality plays, but disguise them as science fiction and fantasy. So, but with a lot of your research, did you were you able to get a lot of firsthand accounts of what happened during the Twilight Zone? Did you were you able to find either actors, directors, stagehands who could give you maybe an insight that was not readily available elsewhere? Yes, yes. I talked to almost everybody who was alive. Uh, a lot of young people who were now in their 50s and 60s. I got insights from actors, from some behind the scenes people some directors. And then there was a lot of research material online that I could find. I, I had some great, great research materials from some of the previous documentaries on the show that were done with people who were living at the time, like Buck Houghton, the producer. And, you know, and then of course, there's some uh, commentary from Rod himself in various things that I found. Well, that, that, I mean, that it must've been fantastic to know that you're really are helping to increase the knowledge base of something you so deeply um, love. Yes, yes. No, I've got wonderful uh, reviews of my book. And then with my new book, which is the fourth edition of the James Bond movie encyclopedia, I've had a, a lot of fun with it because this was the first time I was able to do a James Bond encyclopedia, a film encyclopedia with color photos. Uh, my new book, which came out in November 2020, is uh, over 400 pages. And we have over wow. 400 photos in the book, and many of them are in color. And with James Bond, did you, I mean, is it like what you do with the Twilight Zone where you focus on just one iteration? Or is the James Bond encyclopedia covering all, was it 22 movies now of the franchise? Well, there's actually 27 movies, 25 official and two unofficial. Never Say Never Again was the unofficial remake of Thunderball. 
done by Warners. And then Columbia released the spoof of Casino Royale in 1967 with Woody Allen, David Niven, and Peter Sellers. Uh, I include both of those. Yeah, no, it covers all the Bonds, including the TV Bond, Barry Nelson, who portrayed him in a live TV show in 1954, also uh, based on the Casino Royale book. Uh, so I cover every aspect of Bond's movie world. So every time a new Bond movie comes out, are you like, son of a bitch? I got now spent this many hours out into the encyclopedia. Are you like, or are you like, all right, I get to enjoy another James Bond movie and dive into the encyclopedia one more time for volume five or uh, version five? Well, it is an interesting quandary. I mean, this last edition was the first time I had updated the book since 2003. So I had eight, 18 years worth of Bond movies to catch up on all the Daniel Craig's. So that was kind of fun to just dive into those movies. But it is an organic book. You know, the Bond movies, I always say that there are three things certain in life. There are death, taxes, and James Bond movies. There will be James Bond movies forever. <laughs> I believe that. Well, I mean, I guess in many ways, James Bond, I kind of look at James Bond similar to how I would look at, if you look at comic books, Batman or Superman, I mean, it's things that have become our mythology that now last forever and will be told by many different people, many different generations in many different ways. And I guess in a very real way, each generation is, or you're, at least you're going to see the voice of that generation in that movie. I mean, the Dan Daniel Craig is so much different than Pierce Brosnan, which is different than Sean Connery. And I guess it's probably best that it is different. You know, you you love the move, the Bond you grow up with. I grew up with Sean Connery, so Sean Connery will always be my favorite Bond. But I absolutely love Daniel Craig's performance. I think he's brought a a tough edginess to the character that is perfectly in tune with what we have today. I don't think Roger Moore's style of Bond movies, the more light kind of semi-comic approach to Bond would work today. I think because of the Bourne movies, because of Mission Impossible, you know, all the different gritty shows right now, I think you have to have a hard-edged Bond because the world has become a much harder-edged harder, harder -edged place. So Daniel Craig has been the perfect Bond for the last uh, 15 years. When, when you are watching a Bond movie, can you enjoy it as just a fan? Or do you find yourself analyzing it as an author of an encyclopedia? I am a total fan. I, I sit back in my chair and I remember the first time I saw the movie and I just go with it. I'm not an over an analytic person when it comes to the movie. Certainly there are moments in the Bond series which I don't particularly care for. You know, when Roger Moore jumps the Thai claw, you know, the little stream in the Thailand and that's a 360 degree jump, which is one of the greatest stunts ever featured on film. And they put that little slide whistle music effect over it, which kind of ruins the moment. Mm. I really, I, I, I kind of wince at that. A lot of my least favorite moments were in Roger Moore, for Moore films, but I have to say that Roger raised the standard of Bond in the 70s to a, a very high level and it kept on building. So by the time he did uh, his last James Bond movie, A View to a Kill, the series was even more popular than ever. So uh, you can't knock Roger's impact on the film world. His style was just a little bit, you know, it wasn't really what I wanted. I, I wanted less comic references and more drama. And there are dramatic moments. My favorite Bond movie with Roger is Octopussy. And there are some great moments in Octopussy. Is, is there one James Bond movie that you, you'd say best exemplifies the series to someone who may not have seen one before? The first movie I saw, which is Goldfinger. Goldfinger to me plays perfectly today as it would play, it played, let's see, it would be 51, 51, let's see, 1964. So let's see, that's 36 and 21, 58 years ago, 57 years ago. I'd <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe that Goldfinger is 57 years old, but it is, and it plays well today. That, that you know, that is really amazing. I mean, James Bond really has has some wonderful movies. I mean, and, and it, as you, and you're, you're right, it's a little bit like a Doctor Who as well, where the first one is your favorite. And I, th I, I think my first time I really paid attention to Bond was when Dan Daniel Craig came back and came into the series because it felt... I think a little more serious. I think I said moments of the Pierce Brosnan one, but to me, Pierce Brosnan felt like watching a cartoon version of James of an action movie, while Daniel Craig felt like you were seeing an actual 
guy doing it. You know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Dan, when Daniel Craig got the role of James Bond, a lot of us were kind of a bit disparaging of him. You know, the blonde Bond. And who is this guy? Never heard of him. He's done some movies, but... And then I watched Casino Royale and my jaw literally dropped after that first chase scene where he's chasing that parkour expert on the construction crane into that building. Just stunning. And and Craig, Craig has physically, he may have been the most physical Bond ever because he gets beaten up regularly. He gets, I mean, he's actually hurt himself on the series. He I think he cracked his ankle on this last movie, No Time to Die. I think he knocked his teeth out in Casino Royale. I mean, he's really put his body and soul into this character, and we've appreciated it. it is, one of, is there an issue with a franchise or any franchise because each movie feels a need to try topping the previous one? Do you find that's kind of an issue with in a James Bond movie where they feel like they must up themselves instead of focusing on maybe the internal parts of the story, there's a, there's a need to try to make it bigger than what came before it. And is that problematic? Well, in my very first book, before I wrote the encyclopedias on Bond, I did the James Bond films, a behind the scenes history. And I remember, I think one of my chapter titles was called the Harry Houdini syndrome. And what I meant by that is that it's the whole idea that you have to keep topping yourself. You've got to give the, the audience a bigger trick, a bigger trick. And I think that with the Bond movies, when they first started out in the 1960s, they had the turf all to themselves. You know, there was no competition. And now today, you have all these other series, like I mentioned earlier, Born and Mission Impossible, even Fast and the Furious has done something with car chases that is very competitive. So yes, there is a, there is a sense of, can you top this? Can you top this? How far can you go? And I give the producers credit because they've really kept the bar very high over the years. Even though some of the movies I didn't really care for in terms of being great Bond movies, the production values were always very high. You, When you go to see a James Bond movie as a family audience, and this is a big key to their success, you know you're going to get great entertainment value, but you're not going to be offended by either nudity or bad language. And I think that's something that has kept the PG-13 rating pretty much standard for the series. And well, how do you feel about how CGI has affected something like the Bond franchise? Because once again, fr Bond franchise, one positive that it's, I mean, obviously it's fictional, obviously it's fantasy, but there's still a very real feel to what's being done and a very, and usually it seems to center on practical effects. Do you think what people are able to see now with CGI affects expectations in watching a movie like James Bond? I don't think so, because I think CGI has become so seamless. I would dare some people to even tell me which are CGI sequences. I mean, obviously they exist. Certainly in watching some of the old James Bond movies, long, long before CGI, you see some of the, the bad process work. I mean, when Sean Connery's driving his little Alpine sports car, he's being chased by that hearse in the first James Bond movie, Dr. No. He's on a process screen, you know, he's on a process stage. I mean, there's a, they're running the film behind him and, and it, but you still love it. I mean, I love it, even though it's a kind of, you know, it's not really a great shot, but today I don't really think again, like I said earlier, when I, I sink into that chair, I'm not analyzing whether it's CGI or real. I just want to enjoy it. And, and, and I think, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I do like being able to sit back and just enjoy it. I do. I will say though, I do miss the fact that, especially right now with COVID, you do lose the theater experience, which is definitely un unfortunate. Well, we're uh, gonna we're gonna get theaters back. They're gonna come back, and they're gonna come back strongly. Nothing is gonna keep the American movie theater out of action forever because Americans, well, actually Americans, everybody on the planet likes to go to the movies. I mean, particularly teenagers. And I've always said that you can never knock out theaters completely because teenagers need a place to go that's not under the supervision of their parents. And there's nothing like the old fashioned movie theater experience. Did you find the James Bond encyclopedia harder to compile than Twilight Zone because of the, the sheer amount of movies that have existed over and over that long period of time? 
Well, they're both challenging. I mean, the Twilight Zone, I had to do literally entries on 156 TV episodes. The Bond movies is 27, actually 28 movies if you include the TV movie. So there was a lot of work I had to do. I had not updated the book in 18 years, and I had to update every entry. I wanted to uh, give more biographical information on the on the people. So even though this is the fourth edition of my encyclopedia, it's almost entirely rewritten. So if you bought the first three editions, I think you're going to enjoy this edition because there's a lot more information. Is there any other encyclopedias you're planning on working on and thinking, I want to, to obsessively <laughs> document every moment of this franchise? Not at the moment, Jeff. I, I've actually thought about if there was another arena. I mean, I'm a big Star Wars fan, but they've already done Star Wars science encyclopedias. I, I like Harry Potter. They've done that. I like Star Trek. They've done that. I like Game of Thrones. I mean, I, I think that I'm pretty much focused on my movie writing now, just getting some movies made and into the marketplace. I've got a lot of properties, not only my properties, but uh, I have friends' properties I'm trying to get going. In fact, I've started a literary management division of my production company. It's called Good Humor Literary Management to help sell those uh, properties as well. Good humor being a good operative word these days because we really want to laugh more. So what do you have in the pipeline incoming? I think that nothing book-wise, I think that the next thing I hope to have in the pipeline is a movie. Are you able to share which movie that is? I don't know. I don't know. I've got a, I, I've got a lot of things I'm percolating with, but nothing imminent uh, that's going to happen right away. And, and when you're saying a movie, are you talking about closer to the Great Escape document style, documentary, or are you talking about something fictional, something more nonfiction history? I'm writing primarily fictional narrative film right now. We're writing comedies. I've got a science fiction TV series that I've written the pilot for. I've got some dramas. I've got some animated things. We, uh, with a different writing partner, David Miller, I wrote a children's picture book two years ago that came out after Twilight Zone. It's called The Cat Who Lived with Anne Frank. That's a children's picture book uh, that tells the story of the attic in 1942 Amsterdam, but from the real cat's point of view, there is a real cat living with the Frank and Van Pels family in that Amsterdam back house. Well, that sounds absolutely um, awesome. I, I really hope when, as things come out and you come back on the show and pr help promote them, it was a great pleasure to talk to you. And I think what you've done with those encyclopedias are tremendous. I got a chance to um, look through them. I saw you, you uh, sent over, I think, with, or your assistant sent over some links to me. It, it was so well detailed, so well organized. I, I was really tremendously impressed. Thank you, Jeff. If any of the fans want to reach out to me, I have several uh, places on Facebook. I have three different sites. I have Steve Rubin, R-U-B-I-N. I've got the, the James Bond movie encyclopedia site. I also do something called Steve Rubin's Saturday Night at the Movies, where I do reviews of classic films. And I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm also on Instagram under Fast Carrier, which is the name of my production company. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Thanks to come back anytime. I had a great pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Have a very good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Spooky! And we're back. That's right. We are back. Back in the saddle again. Well, <laughs> I hope you guys really, really enjoyed that as much as we did making it for you. And if you like what you heard and you want to hear more, you got to go check out Spoilerverse.com because at Spoilerverse.com, we have a plethora, amazing directors and artists of all walks of life and editors and writers. And oh my God, are you a lover of comic books like we are? And then so there's many. so many amazing people from the comic book world over at Spoilerverse.com. And I highly implore you to go there and check it out. Yeah, and while you're there, you can check out all the other podcasts on our network, like Bridges and the Geekdoms and Funny Book Forensics and Haphazard Adventures and Nerds in the Crypt and so many more. Misery Point Radio. episodes all the time. Go check all of them out. And check out all of the reviews and previews and articles we have going up every single day for you, every day on Swillivers.com for you to check out, to read, and to love, and to like, and to comment. We have a store link. If you want to help support the site, you can do it two ways. One, go to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash or go to our store link in the middle of the site there and get a t-shirt, a face mask, a hoodie, something. Look fly as hell and help support the site when you do that because we get a dollar or two. 
And, you know, maybe you want to talk to us. If you do, you can do it obviously on all the socials. But if you go to scpod.us slash discord, you can join our public discord server and come chat with us all day long. I couldn't say it better myself, dude. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You just mouthed out a ton of information at once. And really, <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy what you're hearing because we're, we're working our butts off to bring it to you. We are. We are. I guess there's only one left thing. One left thing? Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to go with it. There's only one left thing left to do. What's that? In an oceans of podcasts, we are Cthulhu. As Cthulhu compels you to okay. do- open the mind and read more. Spaghetti. Do you listen to podcasts that sound like this? Hey, welcome back to the Super OK Podcast, where our audio sounds mediocre. Or do you prefer podcasts that sound more like this? Crisp, clear, fun, easy to listen to, and full of awesomeness. Well, then you should check out Spoiler Country, hosted exclusively over at spoilerverse.com.